Good morning. Oh, that was nice. <laughs> um, Brian, that was, I know you don't know it, but that was a really good lead in because the dark underbelly of the topic of today is limiting God. And um, we're talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And um, like I said, that dark underbelly is, can we limit that? And I believe there are times that, that we can. And my question for us and for me today is, um, when we pray for God to move, do we really expect him to? You know, we always cling to, well, if it's in his will, I mean, that's one of the Christianese favorite platitudes. And you know, it's safe because what if it's not in his will? Then, you know, we pray for healing for somebody and that's really a good one to fall back on because we know that God doesn't always heal everyone this side of heaven. So, you know, we can pray and not necessarily expect him to heal them because you know, it might not be in his will. Um, but what if there's no doubt that it's in his will, whatever we're praying for. Um, something definitely in the will of God. We know that God desires for all men to come to repentance. Do we really expect him to do it? Or do we provide him with a bunch of platitudinal landing pads in case he doesn't? Like, well, there's always human choice or... Maybe his will looks different than ours, or we can't always see him move. So when we're praying, God, empower us, are we, well, maybe it's not happening because of X, Y, Z. So I'll ask each one of us a little more specifically, when we ask God to help us win this town for Jesus, do we really expect him to do it? Let's take a look at Acts 1. And we're going to do the whole book of Acts today, so I hope you brought your lunch. <laughs> um, so 40 days had passed. When we first get into Acts, 40 days had passed since the resurrection. Jesus had spent time with his close friends. Over 500 people had seen him. He was gathered with his disciples before his ascension to heaven. He told them not to leave Jerusalem. You guys know the story. Um, but in verse 4, he said, wait here for what my father promised, which you heard about from me. In Luke 24, 49, there's, there's um, basically a parallel, and he puts it, stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. I love that. So the disciples, when they hear this, they're hoping that now, finally, since they've seen the power of God resurrect him, that this means that he's finally going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And he told them that wasn't for theirs to know. Well, it's a good thing they didn't get stuck on that because they would have missed verse 8, which is basically, you could call that the preface to the launch of the church and the age of grace. And y'all know it, you could probably say it with me. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. Now, he said, Think about this. They'd said, because um, it wasn't this random transition. They said, are you going to, you know, restore the nation of Israel? He said, I'm not yet coming into power the way that you're asking. But you will receive power. Remember when they wanted to sit beside him in heaven? Lord, who's going to get to sit beside you? He said, not later. When I restore the kingdom of Israel, but not many days from now. He promised it, the Father promised it, and he was saying, get ready. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now that's a promise. He promised them. The Holy, you'll get power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. But the next part, I've kind of toyed with, and I thought, 
is that next part a promise or is it a command? He says, you will be my witnesses. And, you know, I did a little research and stuff, but I went back to Luke 24 that I just quoted from. And um, it's, it's at the end of um, Luke 24, starting in verse 49. He said, And look, I am sending you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and that's where Mount of Olives is. And lifting his hands, he blessed them. Now during the blessing, he departed and was taken up into heaven. Now right after Acts 8, I'm going to go back when he said to the farthest parts of the earth. After he said this, while they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud hid, the, hid him from their sight. See, see, we're talking the same event. Lifting up his hands, he blessed them. Now, during the blessing, he departed and was taken up to heaven. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses. Not you have to be. The Great Commission had already been given. The Great Commission took care of that. He said, not try really, really hard to be my witnesses. so that you get to be my witnesses. It's not this hard thing that he's giving us, although it does, it, you know, there's stuff to it that's not easy. But he is blessing us with being able to be his witnesses. I was sharing this with Tony, and he just said, yeah, because being a priest was a privilege. And we're a royal priest. And that's a privilege to get to do this. That word power, dunamis, it's where we get the word, anybody? Dynamite. And in Acts, it's sometimes used for enablement, and sometimes it refers to miracles. So the Holy Spirit gives us power so that we can be, so that we are able to, so that we get to. And Jesus was telling them and us that the Holy Spirit would enable them to move past themselves into who they were called to be. Peter, the denier. Thomas, the doubter. Simon, the fighter. Matthew, the cheater. In John 16, 7, he said, It was better for him to go away or the advocate would not come. Now, I don't know about you, but it's really hard for me to imagine why it would be better to walk with the invisible quiet God rather than the visible audible God right I mean if we could do it wouldn't we rather having him have him talking out loud to us and eating with us but they would have and we do have the Holy Spirit within them empowering and enabling them now we all love the verse and most of us have probably prayed it in a prayer sometime now to, it's Ephesians 4.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Right? I mean, that's a chill bunk verse. But then it says, according to the power that works in us. Works in us. So, further down, they watched Jesus ascend into heaven and walked back to Jerusalem. There's 120 people, um, followers of Jesus, all gathered together in an upper room. Um, we don't know that it was the same upper room, but kind of think so. And um, in verse 14 of Acts, it says they continued together in prayer. Now, it was, this was 10 days before the Pentecost. That's a long time to pray together with the same group of people. But things happen when we gather together and pray. And I think that's a challenge for us as a group to find times and ways to commit to gathering together in prayer. And um, verse, like on to chapter 2. Um, now when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, 
this is cool, a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues spreading out like a fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. So a sound filled the house, fire rested upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. He was around them, he was upon them, and he was within them. And they began to speak with languages as the Spirit enabled them. God was demonstrating to them exactly what happens. And I'm not just talking about the tongues. I'm talking about where the Holy Spirit is in our lives, around us, upon us, within us. Now, the tongues were a miracle and they were a sign. And we read about different uses of them in different places in the New Testament. But don't miss the point here because we get so bound up in arguments and theologies that we miss the point in this specific place the main point in chapter 2 and verse 11 is what the people heard they heard great testimony about the great deeds that God had done because the Holy Spirit had come down and the Holy Spirit had enabled them to share what God had done. And that's the basic mean of, meaning of the word witnesses. Witnesses is the, or witness is the um, Greek word martus. And the way that Luke uses it goes beyond just somebody who saw something happen. They hadn't just like stood back and seen them from a distance. It was a personal experience um, that was, you know, up close for them. So advertisers know that the best way to sell a product is by somebody who's used it and preferably likes it. Um, so when we really like a product and we tell somebody else about it, it means something, right? They, they want to, you know, go there, do that, whatever. So um, Jeremy... What's probably your favorite vacation spot? Outer Banks, right? Yeah. Now, you say that it's a favorite spot, but have you been to the Outer Banks? Yeah. You've, like, stayed in a house on the Outer Banks? Have you sat in the sand? Swam in the ocean? Yeah, you have, right? And so the Critchers told us about the Outer Banks. They love the Outer Banks. They go to the Outer Banks every year. I've been, you know, as a kid, Tony had been once or twice to Ocracoke, but, I mean, they love the Outer Banks. So they invited us to the Outer Banks with them. And we had a great week. They took us to their favorite restaurant and their favorite little store and where they get ice cream. And so we became Outer Banks lovers. And the next year, we got a place and we took my sister. And now this year, we're going back again and there's like one place left to sleep if somebody wants to but it's a couch so you'll um <laughs> so you see it's like a, i read about it i mean i knew of it when i was a kid and then i googled you know nice quiet beaches to go to and they always popped up but then when we were told by someone and brought there by someone it made a difference because they were true eyewitnesses and um, verse 14 we see um, we see what happens we see an example of this Peter who had remember been afraid of the reaction of just a servant girl raised his voice and proclaimed himself to be a follower of Jesus and he reminded them, these are the people who um, overheard them praising God. And, and um, some of them were kind of skeptical. Some of them said, oh, they're, they're drunk. How is it that we're hearing about all this in our own language? And he, um, he reminded them of all the miracles they'd seen, done through, seen God do through Jesus. Um, and Peter knew he was an up-close and personal witness because he was there. And um, he wasn't shy. He pointed a finger at them for executing Jesus. And Peter knew because that was pretty much the worst day and time of his life. 
And then with the certainty of a man who had witnessed the empty tomb, he said in 224, but God raised him up, having released him from the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held in its power. This Jesus God raised up. Now, Jesus had told them that they would be able to testify of his death and resurrection, and Peter didn't mess around. Verse 40 in chapter 2 said, he testified and exhorted them. Now, that word testified in verse 40 is that word martus. He was unashamed And this is important, he was undeterred by his past disgrace because he was under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and Peter went at it as a witness to people around the world because they were gathered for the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Somebody said the attendance of the church went from, or the the church itself went from um, 120 to 3,120 in one day. So we're heading into the um, end of chapter 2, and I promise I was joking about teaching through the whole chapter. I did not bring a clock up here, so wave at me when I get too long, Um, and I'll keep going. Um, (laughs) So um, (laughs) uh, that's good, because there's a lot left. Um, So... um, Towards the end of chapter 2, it talks about what they're doing in the middle of all this, and it's, it's beautiful. It's about the people of the church gathering together and breaking bread together and, and sharing like Brian was talking about with each other. And um, Jesus blessed them in the middle of all this by allowing them to be his witnesses And they got to see the kingdom grow. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Now, chapter 3 is a really cool chapter. And I was really, it was going to be the basis of this sermon. But it turned out not to be. So we're going to skim it. Um, Verses 3 through 10 uh, tell of a really cool, miraculous healing. And You may know the story, that's the lame man at Gate Beautiful. And that's the kind of power that a lot of us think of and really desire when we read the verse, you shall receive power. We want to be able to go up to someone and say, silver and gold have I none, although we really do want the silver and gold too. And say, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk. And people were properly astounded but Peter's response to it all is really a lesson to those of us who are longing for the power of the Holy Spirit and striving to work under that power in um, verse 12 he says men of Israel why are you amazed at this why do you stare at us as though we have made this man walk by our own power or piety Now, I get that part about the power. I mean, we can't heal under our own power. And and most of us, at least on some level, grasp that, you know, we, we don't do things for God under our own power. We try to anyway, but we at least theoretically know this. But piety, that was, I looked it up, and that was pretty much a mind bomb for me. Um, because we figure, I think, that if the Holy Spirit's not empowering us, it's because we either aren't good enough or we're not being good enough. Um, Helps Word Study says that the word piety here means that some means someone's inner response to the things of God, which shows itself in godly piety. Now, I would think that my inner response to the things of God would result in me being able to do things like lay my hands on someone and have them rise and walk, right? 
I mean, my heart's right with God. I respond to him well. But Peter said, it's not my own piety that's doing this. And we figure that the special stuff is for the extra good people, right? I mean, the, 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 whole, the super holy people that are just like perfect all the time. And a powerful witness, a wit, I'm sorry, a witness isn't a powerful witness because we are good. It's because... He is. It's like salvation. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. And the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's hard for us to get a hold of. At least me. So right after that, you know, Peter never misses a chance to preach. And so in Acts 3.13, he launches into another bold sermon. He pointed a finger. He accused. The man was not shy. And the same man, <laughs> you say, no, he wasn't. The same man who once denied Christ walked in enough forgiveness to put away shame and let the Holy Spirit empower him to say, verse 15, you killed the originator of life. Of this, we are witnesses. For a long time, of, you know, weeks before, he'd said, I don't even know the man, but he's, you killed him, we saw it. And he preached a message of conviction but then, more importantly, he preached a message of repentance and showed them the way to be saved. Now, something to remember about that word, martus, the word for witness, is that being a witness comes with a price. Uh, in his notes on the New Testament, Albert Barnes says, the original word here is Marturus, and I'm sorry if I blew that a little bit. From this word, the name, what, does that remind anybody of, of a word, this Martus or Marturus? From this word, somebody said it, I think, yeah. From this word, the name martyrs has been given to those who suffered in times of persecution. The reason why this name was given to them was that they bore witness to the life, instructions, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, even in the midst of persecution and death. And in Acts 4, 1 through 3, it says, While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priest and the commander of the temple guard and Sadducees came up to them angry because they were teaching the people and announcing in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So they seized them and put them in jail until the next day. But being a witness also results in a great reward, even if we don't always see it. Because in verse 4 it says, But many of those who had listened to the message believed. And the number of the men, and the notes on this is, that's the men only. So there were who knows how many women and children came to about, 5,000. So after they left Peter and John in jail all night, Annas and Caiaphas brought them out to question them. Now those two names should sound familiar because these were the same priests that questioned Jesus, that tied him up and handed him over to Pilate. Now these two were in a very similar predicament. Can you imagine how that felt? And um, Annas and Caiaphas asked them in verse 7, by what power or by what name did you do this? This wasn't just a curious little question. It wasn't like, now, how, how did you do this? This was a setup, just like they'd set up Jesus when they said, are you the Christ? 
They were looking for, they had an agenda when they asked this. So if there was ever a time for Peter to deny Christ, this was it. But the Holy Spirit had come down on Peter and he was empowered and he began to preach salvation through the name of Jesus in verse 8 to those who had crucified Jesus. Now here's the true mark of a witness. In verse 13 it says, um, chapter 4, verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and discovered that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized these men had been with Jesus. It wasn't their presentation, it wasn't their funny jokes, it wasn't their great music program or their the, you know, climbing wall and their kids program. They, uh, it was their boldness. It wasn't, it wasn't even like their friendship evangelism. It was their boldness. They hadn't been to seminary. It says they were uneducated men. Doesn't mean they're stupid. They just didn't have like a lot of religious learning. They hadn't even been to Collins exegesis class. But they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it showed that they'd been with Jesus. So in verse 4, 17, they'd been talking, the, the leaders had been talking, you know, what can, what can we do about this? So they decided to solve their problem by just telling the disciples not to do that anymore. For it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. So they threatened them again and let them go. A spirit-empowered witness can't help but talk about Jesus and what he has done. So... Are we really walking in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? We can look. Do people know we've been with Jesus? And is it something that we just cannot keep inside? Or are we struggling to think of how we can say something? And in verse 23, they go back and they tell all their fellow believers what had, what had happened. And they, they were out of jail, and here's what happened while they were in jail. And, most of us, if that happened to us, we, we would thank God, give him praise for, for releasing us, and give a praise report, and um, then we'd hopefully all pray together, and we'd ask for prayers of protection. And we'd maybe start to prayerfully plan how we could move forward, if we were really brave, how we could move forward safely, right? Like, how can we do this and not make such a huge stir with the leaders. God protect us. Put a, put a hedge of protection around us, God. Right? Give us a hedge of protection. If they'd done that, the early church would have died before it got off the ground. They did not ask for protection. They did not ask for save, safety. In verse 29 and third, through 31, or it says, And now, Lord... Here's how they prayed. Pay attention to their threats and grant to your servants to speak your message with great courage while you extend your hand to heal and to bring about miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When you pray things like that and you mean it, Stuff happens, because when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God courageously. They didn't ask for protection or a plan. They asked for boldness. So back to my first question, 
when we pray for boldness or when we pray and ask God to move, do we really mean it? I think we have two issues before us. And um, honestly, these have kind of slapped me in the face over the last month or so. I believe that at least for um, the American church, because it's different in other places, right? With the American Christian and the American church, I think we think we're doing a pretty good job without the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did How much of what we do can actually cannot be done without the Holy Spirit? What in our individual lives and in the lives of the church in America and the lives of live in Living Stone cannot be explained by any other way? I mean, this is a group of really good people and this is a group of people who want to follow Jesus and who read the scripture and we want to obey, we want to give, we want to help, we want to show up when things need to be done. But um, other than the fact that we can't do anything without God and that it's the Holy Spirit that reveals the Bible to us, other than that, and this is really... I'm, I'm pointing a finger at myself, okay? Can we point to anything that we could not accomplish just as hardworking and dedicated people? I don't know. I think we pray that the other, I mentioned two issues, and I think our other issue <clears throat> today is that we pray semi-bold and half-hearted prayers because we're afraid of what God might do. If we dig inside, we're afraid of what might happen. And I don't mean that we're necessarily afraid that we'll roll on the floor or run around the church in circles, although I'm, I'm sure some people are, but I mean deeper than that. We just do not get the empower, what the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and what the boldness that comes from him can do. I think we get more worried about the conviction of the Holy Spirit and think, oh, I've got to do this. He convicted me and now I've got to go tell my neighbor or he convicted me and now I have to go do this instead of it being a blessing that enables us so that we can't help but do it. We can only imagine what we can imagine. So when Do we really want the world to come here? I think about that real deeply that I am a snob. People. I mean, I, I like going out and meeting different people and I like diversity and variety, but do we really... We say we do. We say we want outreach, and we want these seats filled, right? We want our church to grow, and we want it to grow for the right reasons. We don't just want to say we've got a big church. I, I've talked with all of y'all. I know that's not what we want. We want our church to grow because we want to reach people for Jesus. But do we really deep inside want them to be a part of us? You know, because... It gets messy. Do we really want the meth head with the missing teeth? The person with the opposing political views? 
or that high maintenance ENG person. You know what that means? Or I'm sorry, the EGN person, the extra grace needed. Have y'all ever been in a small group with somebody who like just goes on and on and on and you're just like, just stop. You know, I mean, we all have one and we're all like, for a while you're thinking, oh, they're so interested and we just love them. And then you're going, I just want to grow in my discipleship group. Um, but, you know, we congratulate, I'm sorry, was that really ugly? Please somebody tell me you have thought that at some time. I am not the only person who's thought that in the whole wide world. Thank you, thank you. See, Tim will admit it. I can count on him all the time. Um, so we congratulate ourselves that some ministry has reached someone and we think it's really awesome, but when it comes down to it, I think deep inside we know they aren't like us and, and they don't break bread with us and they don't really become one of us because they're not like us and eventually they disappear because we haven't made them into our image. Yeah. Yeah, we think it's his image is our image and we don't get that it's not. So are we bold enough to even ask the Holy Spirit for that kind of boldness? Because this is pretty comfortable. You know? God's going to disrupt that comfort. I mean, I'm going to have more names to remember, and I'm not good at that. I can barely remember y'all. Ask um, Jenny. Her, her husband was Greg for the longest time. And I'm going to have to be nice to annoying people. And, I mean, what if we get somebody who shouts, preach, when Drew's preaching? You know, that's like, oh, gee, extra grace needed. Or, you know, again, what if their bumper sticker says they voted for the other guy? You know, that's them. What if they have needs? Are our prayers half-hearted or do we really want to reach this city? And again, are we bold enough to ask for boldness? Do we really, really want that Acts 1-8 empowerment that the Holy Spirit can bring? We're going to pray, we're going to have a song, and it's not going to be one that you really can sing along with until the chorus, So, but at the chorus we can stand and sing together. Father, I always ask you to convict me before you send your word through me. And um, I don't want to be like the person in James who hears your word and walks away and forgets. And I know that this group of people don't, they don't either. And um, honestly, Lord, you know, we don't really even know what this looks like. But we want to. And we don't always want that kind of messy boldness but we want to. And um, I know I heard someone say the other day that they feel like we are on the verge of something. And I believe, Lord, that you have got things in front of us if we're willing to grasp them. And I ask that, please, God, for this church. I ask that you grant your servants boldness to be your witnesses of what you have done for us to a world that really, really needs you. 
in Jesus' name and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.